I also had to get some blood taken, which I don't like needles. Like, I hate them. And to make matters worse, the blood sticker guy, <laughs> you know, that guy, he, uh, he started using poor grammar. He goes, this ain't gonna hurt. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> No, 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 we're not doing that, all right? We're not, we're not, no, no, we're not, we're not. You can't use, uh, like, poor grammar and do medical stuff to somebody. That, cause, cause if he says this ain't gonna hurt, I'm thinking, well, he may ain't not know the difference between a vein and an artery, all right? He may ain't have remembered to wash the disease blood out of that syringe before he stuck it inside of me. We're not doing this, okay? We're not doing this. And it, it's not his fault. The guy was probably good at school in science and bad at English, but I don't care, man. It's a confidence thing. Like, if you want your kid to be a doctor, you make sure they do well in science and English. And if for some reason your kid cannot do well in English, teach them a foreign accent, all right? Like, cause we all know if the doctor's like, me not know the, uh, how you say, how you say, how you say, all oh, that guy's a genius. You do whatever you gotta do, doc. I went to college with you foreign guys. You were always in the library when I was drunk. You do what you gotta do, man. I trust you. Your poor grammar equals high MCAT score. I... Here's the thing, like, it, it's just medicine. Like, I'm not a snob. If you want to fix my car, I don't care if you use poor grammar. Matter of fact, I'd prefer you did. <laughs> if the mechanic's like, that there transmission ain't never ever gonna work again, I'm like, well, I guess I need a new transmission. Obviously, this guy knows what he's talking about. He's butchering the English language. He's probably at the top of his field. I better not no wait no more longer for this no more. No, not. I walked by a construction site the other day. I heard 37 swear words in under a minute. I was like, that is going to be a sturdy building. You ever walk by a construction site and hear somebody say, darn it, or shoot, that thing's coming down. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, is education is important, but we all have different levels of education, right? You know, that's fine, it makes us more interesting. You gotta know who you're talking to. I met this lady recently, we were at the grocery store. She was really nice, we started talking in line. She goes, yeah, my doctor says I need to start reading labels. She had kids. She goes, if I can't pronounce one of the ingredients on that label, he said I should not feed that item to my child. I was like, that's pretty good advice, depending on your level of education. Right? <laughs> if the mom's like, meh, 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 I guess that kid's not getting milk, all right? <laughs> Doesn't seem fair. I can't feed my child Malik. <laughs> my least favorite of, of most of the people on the planet right now are the, uh, the, uh, the end times people. They, they think it's the end times. It's not, by the way, it's not the end times. Just crummy times. <laughs> Try to help someone in front of you. You're doing great, you're doing great. But here's the thing. They think it's the end times. Here's the worst, they want it to be the end times. There are people who wish it to be the end times right now because they want to get to the rapture. <laughs> they think it's the end times. They want it to be the end times because they want to speed it up, get to the rapture. Here's the twist. They've decided that they're going to be horrible people to speed up the end times <laughs> to get to the rapture. <laughs> Let's unpack it. <laughs> First of all, not the end times, just terrible times. Try to help somebody. Second thing, the rapture. I don't know if you know anything about the rapture. Uh, they're not taking horrible people. <laughs> Third thing you may not know about the rapture, not real, not real. <laughs> Literally a parable to get you to not be a horrible person. <laughs> But there's always a silver lining, always a silver lining in every uh, existence, in every moment in time. And the silver lining now is that the Germans are gonna get to be the good guys in World War III. <laughs> I used to get a really big laugh. I did that joke in Reykjavik, Iceland. Four Germans in the front row were like, finally vindicated. <laughs> And it makes sense. If you admit the worst thing you ever did, you get to be the hero in the sequel. So, good for the Germans. 
I was in Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, you know how here in America you can go to a portrait studio and they'll dress you like a cowboy? And they'll take a picture of you dressed as a cowboy and then they'll put a CP on that picture and then you will have a picture of yourself as an old-timey cowboy? I have always wanted such a photo. Uh, in Reykjavik, Iceland, downtown Reykjavik, Iceland, there is a portrait studio that will dress you like a Viking. <laughs> And I said to my husband, a man, always a fun reveal. <laughs> Can we go? Can we go? And he said, we already have an appointment because we are in love. And we went. And they put me in furs and I had a bow and arrow and a shield and a spear and I felt fierce. I felt dangerous. I felt sexy. And then I saw the photos. Uh, so I I'm not gonna lie to you, I look like a tough old bird. I look like the mother of 13, that's what I look like. I look like I just spent 20 years raising Viking children. Which, by the way, sounds like this. Who has been leaving smoked fish out to spoil? Lars, pick it up. And my husband, who makes video games for a living and thus, by definition, is an indoor person, uh, he saw his photos and he said, I look like they came to the village and they're like, we're going to need everyone. <laughs> Including the accountants. <laughs> but who's sexier than the Viking accountant, right? That guy's counting the loot. Steady work. <laughs> the photographer at that portrait studio uh, had a dog, had a St. Bernard Mutt dog. And I said to him, like, you say to a guy with a dog, that is a nice dog. <laughs> And he said to me, she was a rescue dog. And I said, that's great. And then there was a long pause. And then I said to the man in downtown Reykjavik, Iceland, what do you mean by that? She was a rescue dog. And he said, she used to rescue people on ice floes. She was a rescue dog. Oh. In America, when we said that means we've saved a chihuahua mix and we're gonna build ourselves a statue. I would like to pet all of your dogs. I want to pet all of your dogs. I would like to pet all of your dogs. And some of your dogs I'm not allowed to pet because they're shy or they got the PTSD or they're at work. Uh, I have a lot of friends who have working dogs. They have therapy dogs. They put all their anxieties into those dogs and then those dogs shake like whippets. They are the dogs of Dorian Gray, those dogs. But I could be of use to your therapy dog. You got a therapy dog? I, Jackie Cation, very, very friendly animal. I could pet your therapy dog, bleed off some of that anxiety from that dog into this animal right here. Then I give you back empty dog. <laughs> I, will, I will say, Los Angeles is full of a lot of people that are very interesting. I have four younger than me friends who have said to me in the last several years that they were empaths. <clears throat> <laughs> not I'm empathetic, not I'm sympathetic, not I'm patient, tolerant, or kind, but I am an empath. Nope. <laughs> I'm like, like Mantis from Guardians of the Galaxy. Like, like Deanna Troy from Star Trek, The Next Generation. Like a demon from Buffy. No, you are not an empath. You had a human experience. Someone was crying, you made eye contact. <laughs> Someone looked up from their phone and you were there. <laughs> and my buddy, who I love dearly, said to me, no, no, it's more than that. It's like when someone else's dog dies, I feel it just as badly as they do. And I was like, wow, do you, do you feel the hostility coming off of me? <laughs> you getting that? Because the word you're looking for is narcissism and you're killing me. <laughs> They were all much younger than me. They were all, I'm a, I'm a Gen X, the whole generational thing, I don't get it, I don't care. They never even named the generations before the boomers. And then that guy wrote the book, The Greatest Generation. They never called themselves that, by the way. Just so you know, nobody has ever said, hey, we're the greatest generation, follow that. Because uh, that is not how you talk to the next generation. Here's how you talk to the next generation. I'm sorry, we couldn't fix it, please help. <laughs> And they were all millennials, and I'm Gen X, and we got guff. Back in the 80s, I got guff. I was told I was a slacker. I was told that I played too many video games. Uh, and it turned out I lived. So it's all gonna work out. 
But I will say this, I have never seen the pile of guff that you people get. Everyone younger than the Gen X, so much guff. So much guff. Ah, you've caused everything. You've done everything wrong. My favorite thing you've done wrong, I don't know if you know this, but you don't know how to read maps. Did you hear about that? You don't know how to read them. We used to read maps all the time. They don't know how to read maps. They're always looking at their devices. They don't know how to read maps. They're always looking at their devices. I have this to say. I was there in the 80s. There was some map usage. <laughs> Not as much as has been reported. <laughs> we mostly use people. I would call you. I would go, I live here, you live there. How do I get there? I'd write down the directions on a piece of paper. I'd leave that piece of paper on the kitchen table. I'd get into my car and drive as far as I remember. <laughs> And then I'd pull over and go to a gas station or a grocery store and call you again. <laughs> Where do you live from here, I'd say. So you were not fighting a pile of Magellans. <laughs> we don't know how to read the stars either. If I see a tree and it has moss on it, I absolutely never think to myself, ooh, north. <laughs> I, th I think dirty tree, dirty tree. <laughs> My least favorite of uh, all, every generation has this banana head. Uh, there's always some simpler time person who's like, it was a simpler time. When I was a kid, things were easier. It was a simpler time. It was just a simpler time. Things were easier when I was a kid. It was a simpler time. Yes, you were a child. I pray to God it was a simpler time. Unless you were 11 working in a sock factory in Hong Kong, like a buddy of mine, should have been a simpler time. The other thing happening in Los Angeles is uh, I have a lot of friends who are into ghosts. Uh, I don't know anything about ghosts. I don't not believe in ghosts. I just have never met any ghosts. Uh, ghosts are uninterested in me. I have a theory, probably unsubstantiated. Ha <laughs> ha. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> That, um, <laughs> that uh, there, you have to be interested in ghosts to meet ghosts. That's my, that's, I have the same theory about dolphins. Uh, <laughs> I once accidentally swam with dolphins. Have you ever swam with dolphins? Yeah, someone needed a fourth, right? All my friends were going. They needed a fourth person to bring the money down. So I s went and signed up to swim with dolphins. And it turns out I could have lit $300 on fire uh, because... <laughs> I don't know if you've ever, but it's, you're interrupting something. <laughs> their lives, you're interrupting their lives. They would like to hang out with other dolphins. Anyway, I will chase a dolphin or a, a whale. I'll go on a whale watch, I'm there. I will chase it, but I don't want to get involved. We don't need to, we don't need to meet. Have you ever, have you ever gone to an aquarium where you get to pet a stingray? I did it once, and then I thought to myself, how would I feel if a hand came out of the sky and just started doing this? Nope. But I have a very good friend who knows about ghosts. She's a great comic. You ever get to see her do stand-up? She's a hilarious comic. Her name is Karen Rontowski. She also uh, has a podcast called Paranormal Karen, where she knows things about ghosts. And she really does. She knows a lot of things about ghosts. I don't know anything about ghosts, but she was over at my house one time. And when she was over at my house, uh, she said, she thinks I'm afraid of ghosts. I am not. I don't know. <laughs> So she said to me, you wouldn't want me to open this app in your house. It would tell you if you have any ghosts. And I said, app? Where'd you get the app? And she said, app store. And I said, please open ghost radar in my home. <laughs> ghost radar is just that. It's just a radar. Boop, boop, boop. And so she opened it. Guess what happened? Ghost right behind me. Weird. Anyway. <laughs> So ghost radar, there's a ghost right by, there's always a ghost and then a word pops up and that word in my house was red. And we had another friend over and my friend said, I have a red sweater in my car. So what I'm saying <laughs> is that maybe you see ghosts or meet ghosts or know things uh, if you're looking for it. <laughs> I have never met a ghost. Whenever anything might have been a ghost, I tend to go water heater. <laughs> The house is settling. I don't know. <laughs> the other thing is I'm not watching the correct television. A lot of, I've watched more television in the last 16 months than I feel I've ever... I thought I 
was watching a lot of television. It turns out other people are watching different nonsense than I am. I'm watching some other nonsense. And then other people are watching great stuff that isn't the great stuff I'm watching. So uh, there seems to be some judgment there. Uh, but no one's watching my nonsense. My nonsense is Axel. I don't know if anyone's seen Axel. Axel, A-X-L, it's an acronym. The first time I saw it was on the back of a chair on an airplane on mute. And that is how I recommend you see it. It's on Netflix. <laughs> it's terrible. It's an acronym. Here's the story. The story is this. Uh, the army has created a robot murder dog. He doesn't want to be a robot murder dog, so he runs away. And then he finds a friend who has a motorbike, and they run, and they play, and they jump. And I could have written this movie when I was nine. And it's a delight. It's horrible. Anyway, I'm going to ruin this movie for you, because it can't be ruined. Um, it's the dumbest movie in the world. The army would like their robot murder dog back. He doesn't want to go back, so he blows himself up. Now, oh yeah, yeah, we can't handle it as a people. Even a robot murder dog dying in a movie, we cannot handle. There's 20 more minutes of movie after he blows himself up, where we find out that not only has he blown himself up, Axel has backed himself up on the dark web. Yahoo! He's coming back, Axel 2, ketamine, child brides for us all. Uh, the other show that I've been watching is, uh, is uh, uh, Flavorful Origins. I would actually recommend this one. This one is uh, a docu-series, each episode 10 to 13 minutes. It is set in China. It's about Chinese food in small towns in China. It's beautifully shot. It's called Flavorful Origins. And what they do is they go to a small town in China, so, you know, 11 to 17 million people. <laughs> and uh, and they, they show you what noodle or what potato or what meat that they're eating in these small towns and it's beautifully shot and it's delicious looking and I love Chinese food and I love uh, food television and so I watched it but every four or five episodes there would be a uh, there would be a food that I will not be eating <laughs> the last one I saw was the bile from the belly of a goat that then turned into stone soup. Everybody would bring a thing and make a big soup and it was for festivals. And what this told me is that every country, every culture has had rich people say to poor people, you get nothing. And then someone's grandmother has had to take nothing and turn it into something delicious that we now pay $26 a plate for and only eat at Christmas. And hence, Haggis was born, right? And Chitlins were born, and Ludafisk was born. I'm from Wisconsin, you people know in Minnesota, Ludafisk is dumb, it's dumb. <laughs> They're all dumb, They're Dumb. All of our ancestors are rolling over in their graves going, oh my God, eat the goat. What are you doing? There's a goat right behind you. We didn't want to eat the... Lodafisk, if you don't know, Vikings came to Norway. They burned a town to the ground. And uh, there was a salted, smoked cod. Something was underneath the ashes. And somebody's grandmother grabbed that piece of cod and was like... Maybe if we bake it and then boil it and lie and we eat it, everyone won't die. <laughs> it's gross, it's foul. Uh, my grandmother from rural Turkey, Armenian from rural Turkey, uh, they weren't allowed to eat the grapes, they had to eat the grape uh, vines and uh, the leaves. And so somebody's grandmother back in time made dolmades, right? They were like, well, maybe if we boil these and then wrap whatever food we can find in this and then bake it, and, you, and dolmades come, and then 26 bucks a plate. But, uh, the, uh, <laughs> but there's vegetarian dolmades and there's meat dolmades. And to my grandmother's dying day, whenever she would get vegetarian dolmades, she would say, Yelanchi Sarma, which is Turkish for liar's rap. Uh, she was like, we live in America. There's a pound of ground beef around here somewhere. Why are we doing this? And I only tell you this because I live in Los Angeles. And in Los Angeles, right now, I'm surrounded by poor people. And right now, someone is stealing a handful of hazelnut coffee mates and are going to make the most amazing bread pudding you've ever met in your life. And it's going to be available in about six months for $26. I like the gym now. Because my goal is just to get a good body for a relationship. That's a lot easier than a dating body. right? A good body for a relationship is just whatever body got you into the relationship. <laughs> Now just maintain. That's a much lower bar than a good body for dating. By about six abs. 
And now whenever it's summer and I go to the beach and I see like really strong ripped guys with their shirts off, I just think, wow, you must feel so alone to be motivated to look like that. <laughs> I can't watch the Olympics anymore. It makes me feel too sad. It's like, if only you had somebody to go home to, you wouldn't feel the need to jump so high. I, I'm in a uh, long-term, a serious long-term relationship, and I don't know if this is normal for a long-term relationship, but my girlfriend and I get asked a lot whether we are siblings. And we used to say no, like immediately. But now I say yes. And then we make out. Sometimes I wonder, like, does my girlfriend really love kissing or does she really hate me talking? Like, why does she always kiss me so hard when I start talking about history? Like, I get it, it's very exciting, but also suspicious. It's, I hope it's okay that I call her my girlfriend. In my head, I think, should I say girlfriend or should I say partner? But I always end up saying girlfriend. And I think it's because I feel kind of entitled to it. Because I didn't spend all those nights in high school alone wishing for a partner. <laughs> like, oh, the things I'd like to do with a partner right now. <laughs> Right? A girlfriend just sounds a lot cooler. Like a girlfriend will text you from her apartment and say, come over. Your partner texts you from the next room, why haven't you left yet? <laughs> we need toilet paper. Your girlfriend will meet you at a bar wearing a leather jacket. Right? Your partner is at home eating chips in bed and trying to keep it a secret. Sometimes my girlfriend, she'll ask kind of obvious questions. Like we were having dinner at a restaurant and she was like, do you think that the server can tell from watching us that we're in like a serious relationship? <laughs> so I said, well, we walked in holding hands and since then we've been sitting in silence for 30 minutes, so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think he knows <laughs> that this is our anniversary. Then at the end of that meal, that server just brought us separate bills. <laughs> Unprompted. Which is a crazy power that servers have. Where they can be like, I've been watching you two all night, and you should not be together. <laughs> she also asked me, out of the blue, she asked me, like, growing up, did you and your friends ever measure your penises? <laughs> and I was like, no. Gross. We weighed them. <laughs> you get what you need to know a lot faster that way. And if you know the acceleration, you can calculate force. That's a creative way to remind people of physics. <laughs> My girlfriend, she came to me with a list of all the celebrities she thinks she should be able to hook up with if she ever got the chance. And this upset me a lot, but then she said I could have my own list. So I just copied hers exactly. <laughs> so that way if we ever run into John Merrick and be like, hold on you guys, I'm coming as well because he's also on my list. Right, it's important to do things together as a couple so you have shared experiences to tell your grandchildren. My girlfriend is not just my girlfriend anymore. She is now also my landlord. Which is great, because I get to pay my rent using my bedroom abilities. Plus the exact amount of money I owe in rent. So it's pretty tough to make rent now. <laughs> the other day I actually woke her up by, I woke her up, she was napping and she wasn't mad at me. She was, she was actually like, I was just having a sex dream about you. 
So then I said, well, I'm right here. And then she went back to sleep. So it's never been tougher to make rent. I like complimenting her. Sometimes, I don't know if you do this, I'll go for like a new compliment. Like I was trying to tell her that I think she's very attractive and I said, you're a stone cold fox. And then I realized that's a weird compliment. Because what is a stone cold fox? It can only be a dead fox. Like, if we were on a hike and then I saw the carcass, the rotting carcass of a fox, I'm not gonna be like, hey, twins. Every coffee place requires that you give your name. My name is Ophira. Clearly, I do not put that in the hands of a barista to toy with. Uh, because it's just every, every single time I say my name in any context like that, it's always like, an, and the name is Ophira, and they go, oh my God, I've never heard that before. What kind of name is that? And I'll, I'll tell you, so Ophira is, uh, it's a real name. First. Uh, it's a old name. It's a old, old, old Hebrew name that uh, didn't catch on. <laughs> so. And it's very, it's very Israeli. And I have an Israeli friend. And I said, well, it's popular there, right? Right? There, you know Ophira's in Israel? And he goes, no, no, no. <laughs> Old name, nobody wants it. Right. Yeah, I'm the Mabel of Jerusalem, everybody. Just call me Tel Aviv Eunice. So I, I, I have a coffee name. And if anyone ha here has a uh, weird name, I wanna hear it. Because I, yeah, you, if you have a weird name, you get into the vibe. You go into a Starbucks or whatever, and you use your coffee name. You use your caffeine alter ego, you have your Java pseudonym that you use to get your caffeine with as little issue as possible. Okay, who, who has one? You have one? Okay, what's your real name? Alion. Alion, yeah, that's way too hard. Yeah, that's got <laughs> syllables and it sounds like too many other things. All right. Okay, so what's your coffee name? Ellie. Ellie. So cute. Nice, so cute. <laughs> so cute. I love that you're like, and I am very cute as an Ellie. I'm extremely cute as an Ellie. And is that an L-L-Y, Ellie? Actually, why, you don't care. It's not your real name. Who cares how you spell it? Yeah, yes, who cares? Okay, my real name's Sophia, and my coffee name is Joan. Joan. <laughs> That's a good one, right? Joan. Uh, it, it goes great. It goes over great. Uh, however, there was a misstep because I went into a uh, Starbucks. I went into a Starbucks and I was like, hey, can I get a medium coffee? And the name is Joan. And then I just waited. And the barista goes, ah, that's my name too. And I was like, oh, 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 no, I've never planned for this moment. And she goes, do you also hate the nickname Joni? And I was like, I I I've never created a backstory for my character. All I had to say was yes. Do you hate the nickname Joni? Yes, move it on. But instead I just went, oh, it's actually not my real name. It's, it's not my real name. And she goes, what? She looks sort of angry and confused. And I went, no, 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 I like that name. I like that name because it's simple. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's agree. That's not an insult. That is not an insult. Sort of sounds like one, but it's not a real insult. But she took it as one. Uh, and she goes, well, what's your real name? And I go, Ophira. And she's like, what? I go, Ophira. And she goes, that's a stupid name. <laughs> and then she took the coffee cup and the Sharpie and she wrote Joni on it. And that's how I got my coffee. Mm -hmm. Yep. I was served in more than one way at that Starbucks. Love my three kids. Love them. Just like hopefully you, you love your kids. I just don't love being with them. I don't know if that, no, I don't know. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense and I don't mean to be mean, but I love seeing them and it's like, okay, I gotta go cause I can't, like, I don't wanna be with you right now. Like it's, it's torture. Six, four and one, that's our, our ages. It's just no help. 
right? Nothing, we're just us. Saturday suck. Remember when Saturdays were fun? <laughs> Sundays and Saturdays were awesome. Now they suck. Friday night, I'm depressed. I'm depressed, I'm not kidding, because I know I gotta, I got him all day, so I got him in everything. I've got him in, I've got him in every sport possible. I got him in gymnastics, just something where other people watch him. That's my, th right? <laughs> the gymnastics, then they go to swimming, then they got tennis, then they got skeet shooting. I don't care. I don't care. I just want them in stuff, so I don't have to deal with it. I just want a busy day. Karate, I have my daughter in karate, she's six. What a waste of time. This is just a waste of time. She, she does this little thing where she yells. So that it's a kata, right? It's like a five move kata. And she stands like this. And it is cute because she's like, she's so serious. She really thinks she can fight. Like I would kill her and I don't even have any belt. I would kill her in a fight. Even if she had her black belt right now, I would just kill her. Makes no sense. So she stands there and she goes, I don't even know what she said. Is this some Japanese term? That would scare me if I was another six year old. The kata does nothing. I think the kids run away because she does, da -da! Like that. And my wife takes it so seriously, right? Like, because my daughter got her white belt, got her white belt. She bought the white belt. I don't know. My wife keeps saying she got her white belt. Yeah, it comes with the outfit. That's what you get. That's the first belt. Oh, uh, she got it. She got it. So. You might be wondering how old I am. My wife and I are officially HGTV years old. That's how old we are. Started watching people with houses on television. Uh, my favorite show on uh, HGTV is uh, House Hunters. I don't know if you guys have dabbled. Yeah, it's great. Uh, there's a bunch of different variations, the international house boat hunters, tiny house hunters. I like them all because the best thing about that show, it, if you haven't seen it, let me explain it. A uh, couple looks at three houses and then they go and get a pizza and talk about the houses and then they turn off the cameras and get divorced. It is... It's a show about couples fighting, is really what it is. Uh, it's, it's like they shot a whole show in Ikea. It's amazing. Oh, it's delicious. Uh, my favorite one is Tiny House Hunters. That's the best one. I will clarify, in case you're confused, normal size hunters, tiny houses. It's a very confusing name, could go either way. When I first clicked on it, I was hoping it was gonna be like, we love the Tudor styling, but the doors are so high. It's not that. <laughs> that would be on TLC. But <laughs> Tiny House Hunters is fun because it's the most condensed version of the fights because they always get couples where one person wants a tiny house and the other one does not. <laughs> They walk into every house and the guy's like, oh, this is so cool, Sharon, look at this. It's a composting toilet. And then she's like, that's a cat box with a chair over it. I'm cheating on you anyway. And then and she leaves, it's brutal. <laughs> They're also not the smartest people. Every time they open the door to a house, they go, wow, it's so small. <laughs> Did you not notice the camera crew following you around with matching polo shirts that said tiny house hunters? Is that... Oh, did you think it was that you were tiny and the houses were normal? That's very confusing, you're right. Um, I also do not buy, I mean, I, mostly the tiny house trend is over now, right? In most places, we've mostly moved on, which is good, because they don't make a lot of sense, because they're so expensive. If you want 500 square feet and no closets, we have that. It's called an apartment. No one is like, I wish my apartment was in Dave's backyard and did not have running water and cost $500,000. They're like tapas. It's like, oh, this is so fun and tiny. And then you get the bill and you're like, what the hell did I eat? <laughs> As a segue into the restaurant portion of the show. <laughs> I love to eat, man. I do love to eat. That's my favorite thing. I'm a, I'm a foodie. No, uh, a glutton. I'm a glutton. Um, I eat too much. Uh, <laughs> Foodie's just a cool word for it. Uh, my, my favorite thing is uh, trying new restaurants. Anywhere I go is to try new restaurants. Uh, sometimes though, the sad thing is, sometimes I have to pick a restaurant based on a Yelp review. I don't know if you guys have seen these. Apparently we assigned the job of reviewing restaurants exclusively to lunatics. Why did we do that? Every Yelp review reads like the person just got out of a divorce proceeding. Every single review on there is like, they wouldn't let my dog sit at the bar. Yeah, it's a people restaurant for human food. That's normal. I was in New York, I was looking at a bagel place, and the first bagel place, the first Yelp review said, too much cream cheese, one star. <laughs> Who hurt you? What? <laughs> How bad is your life that you get a little bit of cheese for free, and you're like, the internet needs to know about this injustice. <laughs> this will not stand, not while Tom has a computer. <laughs> 
much cheese was it? That's what I want to know. One star? That better have been a lot. That better have been a Nickelodeon game show amount of cheese. If you did not get slimed, two stars at the most. Because that's the point of the place, right? That's the point of bagels is cream cheese. None of us were like, I wish toast was chewy and the middle was missing. We want... Incredible cheese. I think I'm most angry about this because I am a, uh, a vegetarian, so uh, cheese is the last joy I have in the world. Um, I am a vegetarian, uh, mostly because I love animals, big fan of animals. A friend of mine convinced me once, uh, he was like, I don't know if it's wrong to kill animals, but it's probably not wrong to let them walk around. So that was enough, that's good for me. That seems like a solid philosophical basis. I love animals. I like animals so much, sometimes I'll go to a big buck hunter game, put a dollar in, not touch the gun, just watch the deer frolic. Just like animals, man. Actually, the reason I'm a, I've actually been a vegetarian for 20 years as of this year. I started, yeah, I started in high school. And uh, I, I, at first, my friend had said that thing about animals, and I was like, I just wonder if I can make it a week. I just want to try it. And so I was trying it, and then my mom told me that it was just a phase, and so I decided I was going to do it until she dies. <laughs> That's how... People ask how I get enough protein. Spite. I photosynthesize spite. <laughs> Keeps the engine going, turned into bones. I love my mom, I hope she lives forever, but if she dies, I'm eating prosciutto at her funeral. I've decided. <laughs> this is just, this is how I grieve, very thin ham. <laughs> Respect my process. <laughs> I did have an experience recently, I went to a restaurant with a friend that he picked out, and I, uh, tell me if this has happened to you. I went to a restaurant, my friend picked it out, I'd never been there before, I opened the menu, and I realized he's doing better than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> You ever get a restaurant where you're like, I guess I'm having ice tonight. I guess I'm gonna order some ice, maybe a few lemon wedges. How many calories? Actually, just give me ice chips. I'm pregnant, so that's what I need. A uh, bowl of ice. Man, it was so expensive. And then I found out it was small plates. I couldn't afford when I thought that was dinner. And they were like, no, this is just a sample. Um, it was so expensive. I was, and then I, and the, problem with, the problem with small plates, I don't even know how much I'm supposed to order. How many do I need? So I asked the guy and he was like, well, how hungry are you? As if we had a system for that. I don't know, blue, 11 and a half. What do you mean? Every other restaurant has figured this out, but you. It's dinner time, I'm an adult, give me food. I don't understand. And then, and then he said the worst thing. He was like, these are small plates. They're perfect for sharing. What? That's the worst size for sharing. <laughs> You're gonna give me three peas and I have to give two away like it's all over twist? No. <laughs> we have food that's perfect for sharing. Nachos, blooming onion, party subs, perfect for sharing. You can't be like, this is my bathtub, perfect for pool parties. <laughs> it's gotta be big. Oh, this is my twin bed. It's perfect for orgies. I became a fry cook. I worked with Tony. I knew right away I wasn't gonna get along with Tony because he called himself Tony. <laughs> Why would you call yourself Tony when you could be Anthony, which is sexy, or Antonio, mm, right? <laughs> no, I'm Tony. Hey, Tony, what's up? I didn't want to work with Tony. We started fighting right away. We fought over music. I wanted to listen to The Cure and Echo and the Bunny Men and the Smiths, yeah. Tony wanted to listen to Metallica and some bands that sounded just like Metallica, but he swore they weren't Metallica, but I'm pretty sure he just played Metallica all the time, over and over again. Might have been the same song, for all I could tell, just on loop. And what Tony and I did is we pressure fried your chicken. If you've ever tried making chicken at home, you wonder why it's not as good as Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's because they don't just deep fry it, they deep pressure fry it, which is a special thing. We would drop a huge thing of chicken into this giant vat of boiling grease, and then we would shut it and we would lock it in. And the pressure would build up and push the greasy goodness right down <laughs> to the bone. <laughs> so it's moist and delicious. <laughs> But to get that chicken back out of there, you've got to release the pressure, which means you have to hit a button and something comes spraying out of it that I can only describe as grease steam. And <laughs> grease steam is a phrase that should not exist. 
and the little valve with the grease steam, which way do you think it sprayed? That way? No, because that might damage the wall of the restaurant. Boom, right in the teenager's face. It's cool, we don't have problems with our skin. It'd be great. My goal in life is to find the engineer that designed that valve and kill them. So I'm working with Tony with our giant vats of grease. I was a terrible employee. I run to the back whenever I'm inspired to scribble down some words of poetry. Back there writing something Robert Smith derivative, no doubt. And then I come around the corner and I see something shocking. I see Tony and he would appear to be standing next to the giant vat of boiling grease holding his middle finger submerged, yeah, in the hot oil. Okay, your faces say that you want me to explain this. <laughs> you wanna know what the heck is really happening with Tony's finger and the vat of grease, and that's exactly how my brain felt at the time. What is this? My brain offers up, maybe Tony has a prosthetic finger. My brain says back to my brain, oh yeah, that's great, genius. We've worked with him all this time. We never noticed he had a prosthetic finger. He has shown us that finger on numerous occasions. <laughs> we would have noticed. My brain says, okay, brain, then what's your solution? We're watching a teenager cook his finger. And then my mouth says, all right, brain, stop fighting with yourself. Let's just ask him, Tony, what's going on? <laughs> And Tony looks up from this majestic thing and says, oh, this, it's nothing, bro. And he pulls his finger out, he shakes it off, and he gives me a good, solid look at it. And I look, and I see this brown, crispy, fried up finger. And I almost pass out. The lights dim, I lose my balance a little bit. And Tony makes it worse. Tony reaches over and he grabs it and he pulls off the outer layer and he splats it at my feet. And I'm looking at this and I'm struggling to keep my chicken little sandwiches in my stomach. <laughs> and I look back up at him and I'm expecting to see a skeletal finger with a few pieces of gristle maybe hanging from it. But what I see instead is Tony smiling and a pretty normal looking, slightly pink teenager's finger. To which I say, oh my God, Tony, you beautiful bastard, show me how you did that now. Because I loved horror movies. I was in a Tom Savini and the whole splatter thing. I was like, I want in. <laughs> Tony says, it's easy, bro, check it out. And he walks over and he puts his finger in the batter that we battered the chicken with. And then he goes over to the flour with the Colonel's secret herbs and spices. He flowers his finger up nice and thorough. And then he shows me his finger again. And he says, insulation. And Tony pops it down in the fryer. He says, the secret is to wait until it's about as hot as you think you can take, and then go one second longer and pull it up. Voila! And I go, that's fantastic. And I run over and I do two fingers because I got a one-up Tony. There you go, you bastard. And Tony and I became friends. <laughs> we bonded. We bonded all the next month, deep frying our flanges in the back kitchen of Kentucky Fried Chicken on Douglas Boulevard in Roseville, California. <laughs> We did our thumbs, we did peace signs, we did the shockers. <laughs> Going nuts back there. And I liked Tony. It's important to me to tell Tony that I liked him. And one day Tony's leaving at the end of his shift. I said, hey, Tony, I want to talk to you. Tony turns around and goes, oh, what's up, bro? I said, Tony, I just want you to know I really enjoyed working with you this last month. I feel like we've become friends and I really like you. And Tony says, that's cool, bro. I like you, too. Glad we worked together. I wasn't satisfying. What I wanted was to tell Tony that I loved him. <laughs> Which is a very hard thing for 
two 16-year-old heterosexual boys to express in Roseville, California <laughs> in the 80s. It just wasn't the culture to say, I love you, bro, you know? So I said it the way that we said it. I said, Tony, I want you to know that uh, I went out and actually bought a copy of Metallica's Ride the Lightning, and that's an amazing album. I really like it. <laughs> and Tony took it the way I meant it, and he said, bro. <laughs> And then Tony said to me, hey, uh, he looked around real quick to make sure no one was listening. Sometimes when you're not here, I put the Smiths on. <laughs> I tell people you left it on, but I like it, bro. I like it. <laughs> Morrissey feels, you know? Feels. That's as close to a hug as we were going to get. You know? <laughs> and then I pushed it one step further. I said, Tony, I think we're on the same page here. I think we both know where this is going and I'm ready to take this to the next step in our relationship. Tony said, bro? I said, Tony, tomorrow I'm gonna come in and I wanna cook my whole hand. To which Tony said, and this is a quote, yes! 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 Dude, yes! I'm coming in early, and I'm gonna set it up, dude. It will be ready. I was like, damn, I got a pit crew. This is amazing. Let's do this, Tony. Appreciated his enthusiasm. I showed up the next day, and true to his word, Tony had gotten there early. And he'd like triple whisked the batter. Just whisking it till it was smooth like silk. And he'd been there sifting the flour over and over again. Just getting all the lumps out of the flour, just so beautiful and smooth. And my favorite part was him chasing the day cooks away from it. Get up off of that flour, that's Keith's flour. Back off, punk. I walk in, Tony comes over and he says, bro, we got you ready, but I'm gonna put it all in the walk-in so that it's cold, which will allow you a couple extra seconds with your hand under the heat. Tony, you are a genius. He moves the stuff to the walk-in. Him and I go about cooking up some food, doing our thing. We come to a little lull. Tony says to me, you ready, bro? I said, it's a good day to die. Tony gets the stuff out of the walk-in. He sets it up. And then Tony, to my amazement, walks over and takes me by the wrist. And then Tony walks me, holding my wrist over to the batter. And Tony submerges my hand in the batter and then pulls it out. And Tony gets down on one knee and he studies it front and back between the fingers, really inspects it to make sure there's no thick spots, no bubbles. Then it gets Tony's stamp of approval. And then Tony moves it over to the flour. And Tony puts it in the flour and he so carefully, gently <laughs> flowers my hand. <laughs> you ever watch those cooking shows and you see a chef handling a chicken breast and all the women watching are like, if only he touched me like that. <laughs> that was the care that Tony put into thoroughly, evenly flowering my hand and again he pulled it out he got down on one knee and he inspected it front and back gave it the thumbs up said we're ready to do this and still holding my wrist Tony walks me over to the fryer and he stops just a few feet short and then lets go and it felt very much like a father letting go of his daughter on her wedding day <laughs> go claim your destiny And there I was, standing with my beautifully <laughs> battered and floured hand, holding it over a vat of boiling grease. <laughs> this would probably be a good point in the show, uh, for insurance purposes, to say, do not try this. <laughs> for insurance purposes, not for practical purposes, because if you're hearing this and going, yeah, there's no hope, I know. 
you're going to do what you're going to do, because I'm you. I get it. I'm there. I'm holding my hand over this hellscape of boiling grease. My hand, uh, my right hand, a 16-year-old boy's best friend in the world. <laughs> and I have a first-person view in my memory banks of me lowering that hand into the boiling grease, watching my arm disappear at the wrist. I can't wait for senility for that memory to kick back around. You know? <laughs> Did you take your medicine, Grandpa? Not every time about the time I cooked my hand. <laughs> All right, that's a no, Grandpa, that's a no. <laughs> My hand is submerged, and that's when Tony leans in, and he whispers to me, Keith, don't leave it down as long as you would a single digit, because it'll keep heating up longer when you pull it out due to increased surface area. <laughs> and that's when I knew what love was. <laughs> I remembered his warning, got pretty hot, I pulled it out, I shook it so that no hot grease would run down my arm, because safety first. <laughs> and then I held it up, and I looked at it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned that I wrote poetry. <laughs> I've been in a band or two. I've dabbled in painting. I'm a stand-up comedian, and I have written a book. I have yet to create anything that could rival the beauty of that perfectly browned, original recipe, Kentucky Fried Hand. And I looked over at Tony, and I caught him wiping a tear out of his eye. And we knew, we knew him and I, that we were in the presence of something magnificent, something beautiful. And we knew that this needed to be shared, that this couldn't be kept between two flunkies in the back kitchen of Kentucky Fried Chicken on Douglas Boulevard in Roseville, California. No, this needed to be seen. But this was the late 80s. We didn't have Instagram. We didn't have Facebook or Twitter. Heck, taking a picture cost money. We didn't have any of those things, but what we did have was a dining room. <laughs> and I hatched a plan. I decided that in my apron and my cook's hat, I would grab my hand around the wrist and I would run screaming through the restaurant. <laughs> Tony says to me, bro, people are going to puke. <laughs> I said back to him, puke? Dude, I almost passed out when it was just your finger. Bodies are going to hit the floor. <laughs> and this wasn't us talking each other out of it. This was us getting pumped. <laughs> Let's do it. So I get ready, grab my wrist, I make my way towards the dining room. I come around the corner, and what I find is a mostly empty <laughs> dining room. Because we were morons, but we weren't morons that were doing this during the dinner rush, <laughs> you know? We waited. The only people left in the dining room was a father who was probably recently divorced because he had his two little girls with him out to fast food on a weeknight. <laughs> and as I come around the corner, his back is to me but his two beautiful little girls are facing me. <laughs> and I'm holding a Freddy Krueger monstrosity of a hand and inexplicably smiling ear to ear. <laughs> and I see their little eyes get enormous in their heads and both of their mouths open and neither of them can manage to scream. <laughs> And they look at their father for help, but he's chasing that last little piece of coleslaw around a styrofoam cup <laughs> with a spork and just not managing to get it. 
He's no help to them. They look back up at me, and all of a sudden, my hilarious joke didn't seem that funny. So I just abandoned ship and went back on into the kitchen. Yeah, right. Not the right thing to do. Seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Only later did it occur to me how wrong of a thing it was to do. Here, little children, see mind-bending gore while you eat your dinner. Now watch me disappear slowly back into the kitchen. And please know that no one will ever believe you that this happened. I hope those little girls see this special. <laughs> there was a guy! There was a... Jane! Jane, are you watching? It was real! We'll talk about it during visiting hours on Thursday.